Have you ever heard something that, that you, you maybe thought you understood it, but then you realize you really didn't get it, right? Or uh, maybe it's a joke, right? And everybody's laughing and you're like trying to laugh, but you really, you know deep down inside you have no idea what's going on, right? Um, I'm sure you've never been there, right? I have, that's for sure. Or, or maybe somebody shares a riddle and, and you can't quite come up with the answer. Um, or maybe you're like me and algebra is pretty much a riddle and you can't figure it out, nor do you have any desire to figure it out anymore at all. So, um, you know what, in, in some ways that's similar to what we're talking about this morning. This morning we're going to be talking about parables. And Jesus often taught in parables. And, and to some people, they could figure them out. And other people, they couldn't get it at all. And Jesus actually explains why he does this, why he teaches like this, and even explains why some people get it and some people don't. So this morning, we're going to continue to, to look into this question, what did Jesus say? And as we do, specifically, specifically we're going to look at the parables. And when we talk about what Jesus said, we are going to talk about the parables. And this was something that is, as we kind of prepared this series, this was like, we kind of got to talk about the parables when you talk about what Jesus said because of some of the passages. I mean, Mark chapter 4 says this, with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. I mean, you catch that? Matthew 13 is, is the same account, right? same timing. So in this situation, Jesus is teaching in parables. Matthew 13, 34, all these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. Can you, can you imagine this, right? I mean, there, there's all these crowds coming to him and he's teaching in parables. And some people are just like, they're intrigued, but they don't get it at all. They're just nodding, but they don't understand, Right? Verse 35, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I'll open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. I mean, that right there is incredible to think about. That Christ was teaching what had been hidden since the foundation of the world. He was explaining what the prophet Isaiah had addressed in the Old Testament, and he's going to bring clarity to this for those who get it. This morning I titled this message, Do You Understand? Because it really has a lot to do with the reality of parables. Understanding. And understanding was more than just knowing intellectually. It was about really knowing in your heart what Jesus was teaching about and that it was true for you. So Matthew chapter 13 Turn there, if you will, page 477, if you're using the Bibles under the chairs around you. And uh, we're going to talk this morning about parables. So what is a parable, right? What, it, what is a parable? Well, the word parable is a compound word, and, and the, it has the idea of placing or laying something alongside of something else for the purpose of comparison, right? So you have, you have something, you're laying something next to it to compare. And many times Jesus taught a spiritual or moral truth that would often be expressed by laying it alongside of, uh, of something, so to speak, a physical example that could be more easily understood. So a, a common observable object, right, that people had an idea about. Like, oh, so this is what he's talking about. And he would use these examples. Um, and he would use what was well known to explain a complicated truth. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uses a lot of analogies. And they're a little bit different. But he uses these to explain the truths that he was teaching. I mean, think about some of the illustrations that he uses. He had spoken of believers as salt and light. He talked about um, the example of the birds of the air and the lilies of the field and the reality that we don't need to be anxious because God's going to provide for us just like He provides for the birds and the lilies. And he talked about at the conclusion of it building their lives on a rock and not on sand. Well, 
in these situations, people understood what Jesus was talking about. They understood what He was communicating, but further into His ministry, He teaches more and more about parables. He uses parables, which could be a bit different. Listen to what MacArthur says about parables. Teaching through parables and other figurative means is effective because it helps make abstract truth more concrete. I love the way he describes that. Abstract truth more concrete, more interesting, easier to remember, and easier to apply to life. When a truth is externalized in the, figure of a, in the figures of a parable, the internalizing of moral and spiritual meaning is much easier. Like they needed an illustration. Well, in some parables, the story and word picture being communicated was clear and easy to understand. I want to give you an example, okay? Example is Luke chapter 10, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And if you know the story, and I'm not saying that maybe, maybe there's some that don't really know the story of the, of the Good Samaritan. Maybe you've heard of the organization uh, um, Samaritan's Purse, right? And, and what they do is they go in and help people that have incredible needs, especially after disasters. But in the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10, a lawyer comes and asks Jesus, who is my neighbor? Like Jesus says, we've got we to love our neighbor as ourselves, right? And then He says, who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. And at the end, Jesus asks the lawyer which one of these examples is the neighbor. And He uses those different examples, right? The priest, the Levi. And He says, which one is the neighbor? And He says, it's the one who showed mercy. And Jesus replies, you go and do likewise. It was clear. Everybody knew what Jesus was communicating. Everybody knew that the example that to follow was the example of the Good Samaritan. It was very clear. But then there's other times when there's parables that are not easily understood. And Matthew chapter 13 is one of them. If, if you just simply take what Jesus talks about. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus uses familiar figures such as soil, seed, birds, thorns, rocks, sun, wheat, tares, mustard seed, leaven, hidden treasure, and a pearl. Now however, what's interesting is that in these parables themselves, the truth is not made clear. Because the basic storytelling, uh, uh, the basic story tells nothing but the literal account without presenting the moral or spiritual truth. So what Jesus does in Matthew chapter 13, He starts out and He kind of gives this parable, but He doesn't really compare it. He doesn't really fully explain it. And it's only to His disciples later on that Jesus explains what the wheat, the seeds, the thorn, and all of these things really meant. So why does Jesus do this? Why does He teach in parables? Why not fully explain it to everybody? Well, I think Jesus answers those questions for us in Matthew chapter 13. Well, He starts out in Matthew chapter 13, He's along the sea. The crowds have come to Him. They've gathered. They're getting larger and larger and larger, right? People are, are seeing the, the miracles that Jesus does. They're seeing what's taking place. The crowds get so big, Jesus has to go out along the Sea of Galilee. He gets into a boat so the people can gather on the, on the shore and teaches from there. And listen to what He says. Matthew chapter 13, verse 3. He told them many things in parables, saying, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced green some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Now, now stop and think about this really quickly for a second. Okay. He just he kind of gives this whole thing, but he he doesn't give it anything to compare it with. I mean, if we can really look at this from this perspective of these crowds are gathered and they're like they're waiting, right? They're like. Okay, he's going to finish this, right? He's, he's going he's to pull all the pieces together and help us understand it, right? Take a look at verse 10. His disciples came and said to him, 
why do you speak to them in parables? Like, Jesus, what are you doing? We are kind of confused here. And what, what they're really probably saying in some regard is, we actually have no idea what you're talking about right now, right? I mean, they're trying to like, Jesus, Jesus why are you teaching to the crowds in parables? But I think probably inside they're like, why are you not explaining this to us either? See, to this point, as I said, the crowds are growing, right? In Matthew chapter 12, after the Pharisees had confronted Jesus about the Sabbath, he declares himself to be Lord of the Sabbath. And, and Jesus was performing miracles, including a miracle on the Sabbath. So the religious leaders, they're outraged at what's going on. And the crowds are so big, right, that he's had to make these adjustments. And his disciples are waiting for him to take charge. They're like, okay, it's gotten big. He's kind of made it clear. He's the Messiah. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. He can heal. He can do all these things. Now we got these massive crowds. Now he's going to lay it all out there for everybody to see. This is what's coming. Buckle up. And he teaches in parables and doesn't explain or doesn't compare them at all. And they're like, what is going on? They don't understand. So they ask, why do you speak to them in parables? Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 13, verse 11. And he answered them. To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given. And he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. He goes on. This is why I speak to them in parables. Okay, <laughs> And now they're like, okay, now he's going to answer. Because seeing, they do not see. And hearing, they do not hear. Nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. See, what Jesus is, is doing is he's, he's now taking the Old Testament and He's going to pull all these pieces together. And what He's telling the disciples is, listen, you get it. You're going to understand. You're going to know. But to these ones that don't know, they, they, they can see, but they're, they're not seeing. They can kind of hear, but it's, they're not hearing. They don't understand. It's not connecting. And what Jesus does is He quotes from Isaiah chapter 6. And in its an original context, Isaiah 6 is part of Isaiah's or God's commission to Isaiah as a prophet, right? In, in response to seeing God exalted on his throne, Isaiah responds to Yahweh's question, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And then he says, Here am I, send me. That's what happens right before this. And verses 9 and 10 then give the account of Isaiah's message to the rebellious Israel. God's going to send him out. He's going to commission him to denounce their spiritual deafness, their spiritual blindness, and their hardness of heart, which was what kept Israel from responding to God's call of repentance. You see, spiritual blindness, spiritual deafness, this is not new. And it wasn't new for Israel. Take, take a look at what was going on in Moses' day. Deuteronomy chapter 29. Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt. Like You've physically seen how God has performed incredible things. To Pharaoh and all his servants, to all his land, the great trials that your eyes saw, the signs and those great wonders... But to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. Like, like they saw it, but they didn't see it. They heard, but they, they didn't. They didn't understand. They don't get it. It's not clicking. It's not connecting. It was taking place in Moses' day. It was taking place in the days of the prophets and Isaiah. Listen to what it says in Psalm 115. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God's in the heavens. He does all that He pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but do not speak. 
eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear. Noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel. Feet but do not walk. And they do not make a sound in their throat. He's talking about these idols, right? These, they're worshiping these idols and these false gods. And then he says this in verse 8. Catch this. Those who make them become like them. Think about all the senses that he just listed. Right? Eyes, but they don't see. Talking about the idols, right? Eyes, but don't see. Ears, but don't hear. He goes through all of these things. He's like, this is these images of stone or of wood. They, they're lifeless. They're dead. It's just a rock. It's just a piece of wood. It's nothing. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. Listen, when you worship false gods and idols, you become like them. Spiritually speaking, you're, you're dead. You're lifeless. So when Jesus quotes Isaiah and applies it to the, the, to the crowds now, they're, they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. They want to see all the miracles. They want to see Jesus do all the, the cool things, right? Jesus, perform another miracle. Right? They're on the edge of their seat waiting. Jesus applies this quote to this crowd. And what He's doing is He's identifying this reoccurring pattern in Israel. Spiritually dead. In fact, notice what Jesus says about Isaiah 6. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. It's fulfilled with this generation. MacArthur continues the, the sensory malfunction, right? Eyes, ears. The sensory malfunction and hardness of heart directed towards Jesus is the culmination of that pattern of what you saw all throughout the Old Testament. The climactic nature of God's revelation of Himself in Jesus leads to a heightened level of sensory malfunction and hardness of heart that fills up the significance of previous occurrences of this pattern. Yikes! Jesus goes on, verse 15, to say this, For this people's heart has grown dull. And with their ears, they can barely hear. And their eyes have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts. It's more than intellectual, right? Understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. But He says to His disciples, blessed are your eyes for they see. And your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and hear what you hear and did not hear it. I, I don't know about you, but when I, when I read that verse, it just makes me incredibly grateful for salvation. that God loved me of all people enough to send His Son to die for me. That God would love me enough to give me eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart that understands the Gospel message to God be the glory. Great things He has done. Because the reality is this as you walk through this passage. Some people got it. And some didn't. You know, the reason Jesus taught in parables was to expose their spiritual condition. The, 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 the parables are they're kind of like spiritual thermometers. Right? They take our spiritual temperature and they tell us what's going on. They tell us if there's sickness in the body or if there's not. And this is why Jesus repeatedly says, He who 
has ears to hear, let him hear. Similar to even in Revelation with the churches. Because those who who have been made spiritually alive and are now able to hear and understand, they can can know God. And they can know salvation. And they can know eternal life. Listen to what John writes. The words of Jesus in John 5.24, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears My Word and believes Him who sent Me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. If, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and have been for, for any length of time, you probably understand kind of what Jesus is talking about here. You, you hear God's Word proclaimed and taught and you understand things and you get it and you make the spiritual connections you you understand and you even recognize you need to apply this to your life doesn't mean we always do it but at least we know we need to right but you've also probably seen when someone is not a follower of jesus and they hear the word and and you think like you're you're thinking as a believer in fact if you've ever brought somebody to church with you that's not a follower of christ And I'll tell you, I I know people do this a lot with baptisms, and it's a great opportunity to do that when somebody gets baptized. And you bring somebody with you, you know they need Christ, and they're sitting next to you, and all the while, you're you're probably, I mean, you should be praying for that person, right? Praying that, that God would give them ears to hear, right? And a heart that understands and, and you're listening to the testimonies and you're hearing the word taught, and you're like, man, this is perfect like man this couldn't have been scripted any better for my friend or family member that's with me like they wow this is amazing god and then you get to the end of the service and you're like hey what did you think and they're like that was cool it was all right it was fine or maybe they're like I, honestly i didn't really get it at all and you're thinking, like, how in the world did they not get it? How, how did they not put all the pieces together? It was just so clear. And what you begin to realize is that the more they don't know, and I've seen this take place, it just seems that over time, those who hear the gospel repeatedly, it just seems like the more they hear it, the more. They turn away from it. And the more, they're hard, more, the more hardened their hearts become. Listen to what Craig Blomberg says. For those without ears to hear, parables seem to conceal more than they reveal. So that superficial hearing and seeing do not lead to spiritual understanding or perception. D.A. Carson puts it this way, Jesus teaches in parables in such a way as to harden and reject those who are hard of heart. Man, that's hard to to read, isn't it? We we don't like the sound of that. Jesus teaches in parables in such a way as to harden and reject those who are hard of heart and to enlighten, often with further explanation, His disciples. Like for those who, who, who are open and receptive to the gospel, right? There's a point at which people give their life to Christ and they start here and they're like, man, it's clicking now. I get it. I get it. And, I, and I've had people say this, like, you know, I, I first started coming, I didn't get it at all. I gave my life to Christ and now I understand things so much more clearly. Why is that? Christ in them, the hope of glory, the Holy Spirit. It's salvation taking root in their heart and in their life. And then there's those that it seems like Man, they're going to get it, right? They got it. Like, they're going to hear it. Like They keep coming. 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 And in all reality, they keep rejecting. They keep rejecting. They keep rejecting. They keep rejecting. Can, can I just say, if you're someone who's not a follower of Christ, don't harden your heart to the truth of the Gospel. You need it more than I could ever express. And really, 
as followers of Christ, our prayer should be for those who don't know Christ that God would give them ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to understand the gospel. Because only God can do that. You can't save. I can't save. God's the one who saves. He's the one who's got to do that work in their heart and in their life to give them those supernatural senses to understand the truth and preaching of the Word of God. Well, listen to what John writes in John 12. Words of Jesus, while you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of the light. When Jesus had said these things, He departed and hid Himself from them. I mean, stop and think about some of this, right? Jesus is like, while you got me, and follow, trust, believe, become sons of light. When He said these things, He departed, hid Himself from them. And though He had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in Him. So that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what He heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Verse 39, Therefore they could not believe, for Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Verse 41, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. They wouldn't talk about it. They wouldn't confess with their mouth that Jesus was their Lord and Savior. So that they would not be put out of the synagogue. Why? For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. These, these are sad verses. As, as Jesus recognizes what's going on, and, and as John, right, you, you got to imagine for a minute John writing these things and, and pulling these pieces together. And I love to kind of lay first John over the Gospel of John and recognize all the teachings that John wrote about Jesus. And then he just goes and builds off of those in 1 John in so many different ways. But what, what happens here is, is Jesus is taking the spiritual temperature of the generation of that day and there are some who got it. They even understood it. But they chose the glory of man over the glory of God. It made me think of, of last week, Matthew chapter 7, truly the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it unfortunately are few. Many will not understand. Many will not see and many will not hear. Well, the question looms, what is your response? Like at some point, as we talk about the parables, and there are those who reject and those who accept, the question comes, what is your response to the parables of Jesus? What is your response to Jesus' teaching? And to help you answer this question, I want to come back to the parable that Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 13. And I want to look at Jesus' explanation of it. He goes on later to explain this parable, and he says this. Hear then the parable of the sower. Now he's going to give us the comparison, right? When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. That's that. See, oh, now we get it, Jesus. Now we understand what you're talking about. You're talking about the seed of the gospel, the good news of Christ. When someone hears the word and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away. Verse 20, what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. They're like, yes, I want it. This is, 
This is what I've been looking for all along. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. Like, "Eh, I'm not a follower of Jesus. (laughs) Me, no. I don't believe. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word. They might even get it, right? But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. Man, is that America. The deceitfulness of riches. The cares of the world. Verse 23, as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, another sixty, and in another thirty. Okay, Jesus, now, now we understand what you're talking about. Now we get it. You're talking about the seed of the gospel that is sown. And there's a reality that for some people, they don't understand it. The enemy just snatches it away. There's others that they get it and it springs up for a little bit, but they don't have any depth of soil. No root that's really needed there. That's, that's the importance of growing continually. Of working out your salvation in fear and trembling. And others fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and they choke it. But there is the one that's sown on good soil. It's the one that Matthew writes, the one who hears the word and understands it. It's interesting to note that when you you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account of the parable of the sower, it tells the complete story of the gospel. If you've never noticed this, it's a great like underline it, put a little note in your Bible, maybe in the margin. But this next slide, I, I hope that for some of you, maybe probably a lot of you know this, and some of you know this, but I hope that if you never realized this before, it kind of pulls it together for you. Matthew writes, it's the one who hears the word and understands it. Mark, in his description of the parable of the sower, those that were sown in the good soil are the ones who hear the word and notice, accept it and bear fruit. And Luke writes, as for the on the good side, they're those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. Notice the progression of what takes place there. Did you notice that? It's the one who understand it, right? Mind and heart. Like they get it. They get it. It's not just an, an intellectual understanding, it's more than that. And then Mark builds off of that and says it's the one who accepts it, right? It's like Christmas. We already got somebody in our house that's counting down to Christmas. I think it's 37 days or something. I don't know. If I'm wrong, that's okay. Don't, don't. I know, I know, I know, right? Don't worry, you still got time to figure out my gift. It's fine. Totally kidding. But think about it, right? When you think about Christmas, right, you got to receive the gift. You got to accept it. The gift can be right there under the tree, but you got to open it and you got to accept that. It's not enough to say, oh, yeah, I know the gift's there. Yeah, that's awesome. It's cool. I see it right there. It's cool. It's great. Thanks. Appreciate that. No, you got to accept it. You got to receive it. You got to believe it for your own, right? It's got to be yours. And notice what Luke writes it's the one who holds it fast in an honest and good heart. They're not letting it go. It's, it's kind of like, man, this is the best gift I've ever received in my life and I'm going to treasure it with everything that I have. That's the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is the one who bears fruit. And I love how Luke writes it. Bears fruit with patience. <laughs> Takes time, doesn't it? And those roots need to grow deeper and deeper and deeper. They understand it, they accept it, and they hold it fast. They are not looking back. 
Listen, if, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and some of you are like, yep, yep, yep. Why? Because you get it. Because you have ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts that understand. And if you are a follower of Christ as you hear these words, I want you to listen again to words of Jesus in Matthew 13, 16. But blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. Amen? I I hope that as you look at this and you hear these teachings that you're just like, God, thank You for giving me eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart that understands Your Word. Because it's God who has done that work in you. If you're unsure if you're a follower of Jesus, or if you know you're not a follower of Jesus, we are praying that you will understand your need for the Gospel, for the Savior. Our prayer is that you'll have those eyes to see, those ears to hear, and a heart that will understand the Gospel. That you won't be like those who are caught up with the glory of man, but that you are drawn to the incomparable glory of God. So as you think about the parables, I think it boils down to the title, right? It boils boils it all down to, do you understand? Do Do you understand? If not, we 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 want to pray for you and pray that God would soften your heart. To accept the truth of the gospel of Christ. That you would, like Romans 10 9 says, if you'd confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you do understand. Your answer is yes, I do understand. I'll tell you, an an interesting follow-up study for you this week would be to go to Romans chapter 10 and to study that whole chapter out because he clearly talks about seeing and knowing, understanding, talks about all these things, ears, eyes. So check that out this week. But if you do understand, I want you to listen to what Paul writes later in Romans 10. How then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in Him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. If we understand, if we see, if we hear, Our task is not to save, but our task is to take that message to those who need to see and to hear and to understand. Why? Well, later it says in that chapter, because faith comes through hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. Do you understand? If not, we are praying for you that God does the work of salvation in your heart and life that you will soften your heart and not harden it toward God. And if you do understand, we know what our task is. And may we be those who are grateful and thankful every single day for salvation, for Christ in us, the hope of eternal life with Him. God, we come before You today and we want to praise You and thank You for the teachings of Christ, for the truth of His Word, for the for the parables, that for those who know Christ, we read them and we study them and, and we hear the explanation of it and we totally get it, not just intellectually, but we get it personally. We get it in our, in our heart of hearts, so to speak. We, we recognize 
what they're talking about because we have salvation in Christ. Lord, we thank You that these things that have, were revealed through Christ, we're thankful that You chose us to understand them. We're thankful for salvation and all that we have in Christ. And Lord, I do pray for the, the one or the many that are hearing this today that don't know Christ. I pray, God, that You would do that supernatural work that their senses would come alive in seeing, in hearing, and in knowing Your, your salvation in a personal way. God, do that work. And God, may we continue to take this good news to the world around us. May we live lives of gratitude knowing who we are in Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.